Welcome to a new universe of procedural random. Well, the buildings, geometry, the roads, the water lines comes from OpenStreetMap. Carefully curated and chopped into tiles in our servers at Mapsen, then tessellated and extruded on Tangram.js, our 2D, 3D map engine. But the rest, the grids, the numbers, the patterns, the pulsing tiles, the movement of the camera, all that is constructed in real time, directly, directly in the graphic card of this computer. There's no video. The language to program directly on the graphic card is called shaders. Hi, my name is Patricio Gonzalez Vivo. Um, I'm an artist uh, interested in uh, landscape. This is some of my previous work. Um, and uh, a year, well, almost like two years ago, I have the privilege of being working uh, with all these great engineers and designers. I, I have been learning so much. So I, I feel very uh, privileged to be working there. Um, and mo especially because of everything that we do. Oh, since, since when that happened? <laughs> Thank you for pointing that. Um, so all the things that we do are open source. Um, so please enter to our website. We, there's this, we would like to listen to your needs and make things happen. Um, we have a part where it says uh, you can get an API key for free, so uh, please pass and join. So there I have been working in some of these experiments, um, working with from the back end to the front end, and lately I have been working on the engine, um, not just like doing implementations on it, but like pushing the limits of what cartography is, and because I'm not a cartographer, I kind of, kind of do that. <laughs> Um, so I am having a lot of fun doing these um, demos and stylings for the maps that we do, and lately I have been trying to add more data to that. Um, so I have been uh, finding ways to bring animation and data to our maps. Um, and most of the examples that we saw here uh, use what is called GLSL shaders which is particularly, particularly the thing that I love the most and what I really enjoy about my work. So what are shaders? So who, let's, let's do a, a test. Who knows what a shader is? Great, this is awesome. Um, so, um, so I'm going to go through a small introduction to it. I, I have been working in my free time in this book called The Book of Shaders, and we're, I'm going to bring some of the contents of it uh, into the presentation. Um, so if you feel lost or, you're, or you want to uh, dig deeper, uh, I encourage you to take a look to it. So this is a shader code. Uh, and we, we can start thinking, um, if, you, we, if, if we take a, a look to it, you will notice that it looks like C. Yes, it's a blend of C. Um, so you see your main function there, uh, and then and then there's uh, it's very small, and then you will discover there are specific variables and things happening there. So I will try to do a small interpretation of what is happening here, and and it was great that Mariko. Uh, where you go, uh, present that because every all, all, the, all what she, she was explaining about the double loop, the double loop um, to do pixel by pixel calculations. Actually, everything that she puts inside that do that double loop uh, goes inside this part. So I'm going to go back. And I'm going to start speaking in metaphors. So I like to think in shaders uh, as the Gutenberg press. So shaders are for graphic engineers like me what the Gutenberg Press was for um, authors of books. They let us free for the one single thread that, there you go, against 
thank you for explaining that. Um, and let us like put our work in designing a page. So making an elaborate algorithm that will, once we have it, print a whole page once at a time. So there is no need of like creating a letter after a letter after a letter to make a word and then like put all words together in order to have a line and then like several lines makes a paragraph and several paragraphs make a page. Here is every, all the letters, all the words, everything in a single page happens at once. So I have a second metaphor to explain that. And I like to use this particularly with my students. So imagine, imagine this like single thread as a pipe, right? It's designed, it's robust, your computers, we, this century, we, we have like very, uh, this year we have a very robust computers. Um, so they are designed to do like very complicated tasks. And probably I see a lot of uh, new computers, so you have like around four of these big pipes, four cores. Um, but for small things, for example, com computing pixel by pixel, that slow down. So Mariko, she was like speaking about how when you make pixel by pixel operations, this uh, slow down your computer. Well, why is that? Because imagine that uh, deciding a color of a pixel is a very tiny little task. So if we have these big boxes that are like complicated tasks, uh, deciding the color of something, something very small. So we can picture it as like a ping pong ball, right? So in an old computer, in an old screen, that's almost half a million of pixels to compute. And in a screen running at 60 frames per second, it's almost 26 million calculations per second. Imagine now when with one of these new like retina displays, uh, it's just very about 5 million pixels. Put that at 60 megahertz per second, it's 250, around 250 million calculations per second. It's insane. So if we try to do that with a CPU, we get a sad CPU. <laughs> and so imagine that we have this like industrial pipes and we're like trying to put all that stream of pixels, of ping pong balls, of these small calculations, uh, and you will have, they will stuck right, right in the entrance. So hopefully, and thanks for everybody here with a, a new computer, um, engineers have solved this problem by using parallel computation. Um, this, is, uh, this has been out for a while, like 15 years ago. Um, and, and the idea of it is, is like to subdivide, to have like little tiny little um, pipes, very small processors in running in parallel. So going back to our uh, metaphor of the big industrial pipe where things pass, these are like more like, I don't know, toilet paper uh, tubes. <laughs> So, so the idea is that the, this, is, this constant flow of, uh, of ping pong balls that are like, our computers all the time generating will pass through them like water in a strainer. Each one will go for a different pipe, right? And to illuminate this metaphor that I am like insisting on, <laughs> um, imagine each one of these tubes as something that is less powerful of a, an Arduino. I don't know if some people has like the chance of programming on an Arduino, but it's very simple because an Arduino, you what you give it is a, a, a C code. So imagine that you have a table of Arduinos, and you have the, the and each one of them is controlling one line, one light, one like LED light, um, LED, RGB light to be more precise, uh, and you have the opportunity to flash them all at. The, once and at the same time. When I say fl flash them all, I mean like upload a, f a firmware all at once. Um, and also imagine that these, all this stack of Arduinos that here are not enough. You, we have one, imagine that you have one per, pi per pixel. Uh, they share some resources. And one of the resources they share is, uh, is, is a memory. And this specific memory is what we call the memory of your graphic card. Probably you have heard that when you go and to buy a computer. It's a completely separate memory that is designed to allocate images and geometry, mostly. So this is my, this is my introduction to what a graphic a GPU unit versus a CPU is. Um, so let's, let's jump into the coding part of this. So be patient with me. I'm going to make this bigger. To Everybody can see 
right? So this is a, an online editor that I made for the book. Um, this is where I spend most of my time coding examples. Um, and I want to point out to some, some, some important aspect of, of this code in order to uh, explain what shaders are. So this is the main function where everything happens. This first variable over there is the position of the pixel that is uh, running the computation. So each one of these pixels on this viewport is running the same function. Here it receives the information that where it's located. And here is the, is the variable that you will, we will write what is the color of that. So if you're having been paying attention, you will know that um, these colors are, as Mariko also noticed, um, it has four values, right? But here, instead of going from zero to one, uh, to 255, it goes from zero to one. So we, we will say that all the values are normalized for the colors. So we pass here our color. In this case, we are passing the position, sorry, the position of the, of the pixel, normalize it. And the, in the blue channel, we are putting that sinusoid uh, wave of the, um, the various of it over time. Um, so let's, let's do some, let's start making something more fun. So I'm going to take this line out. Boop. And in order to illuminate what I just said, I'm going to put the coordinates in X. So you will see that now the pixels in the top, in the, this side, <laughs> in this side are zero, and when they achieve, when they get closer to the other side, they get one, right? And this makes this nice gradient. If I change the x by a y, um, the same happened from bottom to top. So now, if we put two things together, we know that the top, the zero, zero position is the top low, uh, the right low corner. <laughs> so, um, so let's let's. I, I will do a small demo of how to make a shape of this. So I'm going to get the dot product of st, which is the coordinate system, and that will give me this like half sphere here. Um, I want a circle, so I, I'm going to move the whole coordinate system, the, the variable that holds the position. I'm going to move it. And aside, so I'm going to pick this. So well, this is we can say that this is five five. And then there's um, what I'm, I love the most about uh, shaders is that the API, the language is very small and it's mostly mathematical, and the code looks very uh, atomic. And also the language comes with a uh, with some useful functions, and one of them is essentially a uh, threshold, which is called step. So we're going to say that the, from the, that's not nice gradient, we want to cut it in 0.5. Um, so if, so we are like, um, in, in the previous step, we imagine that that was like a mountain, like in, from white, black to white. And here we're like making a, a a sling cut in one specific point. Let's invert this, and now we have a red, a black, um, white dot over black. And and this is this is where the part, the, the moment when I was like, oh, okay, I'm sold. I I, I buy this technology. Um, because this is calculated in each one of the pixels on the screen. It doesn't. It, there is not, not there is not, not, not nothing like a circle. So if you have drawn circles before, you know that there is a moment where the computer is like getting angry and sad that you're making so many circles. But here, because everything is calculated per pixel, is the same if you put one or a million. And then let me show you that. So I'm going to grab the screen space. I'm going to fract it. That means get only the fractional part. And I'm going to multiply this by one first. And then I'm going to multiply it by two, three, four, five, ten. 100, and the computer, the, and, and the frame rate is constant because it's, I'm not in any place saying draw one circle. I'm, each one of these pixels is giving the coordinates to draw a circle, 
and they are checking if they should be, be drawing something black or white. I hope that makes sense, and uh, I'm afraid to look to the screen, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one more, la another example of that. Um, I'm going to make ST, and I'm going to add ST to S SY, um, and the, I'm going to use this to, oh, sorry, I'm drawing over black. So basically, I'm making a sine wave using the combined position of x and y. So that makes a sine wave um, in the side. So uh, let's multiply this by that big number. So or more big, too big. Um, and now let's do the step thing again. And we have a straight pattern. So, so this technology is, 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 is not rare that this is um, used a lot in game in the industry because it's very cheap to make textures, uh, generative textures, dynamically. Um, and that's what I love about this. And I, this is what I do all day. Um, so that brings us to the second theme. How to apply this to a map? Well. Um, the, um, the data comes from OpenStreetMap, right? And, and that's vector tiles. We, have, we, we chop the information from vector tiles, the, from OpenStreetMap into vectors. Um, so basically that's like SVGs, right? Positions on the screen. And then uh, what we do is we extrude them. Some information in OpenStreetMap, for example, the buildings. Some, some buildings have width, uh, height. And so we generate extra geometry in order to make that extrusion. And this is basically the canvas uh, that, we, that I, I work with. Um, once we have this, uh, I can apply, using the same techniques that I, I showed before, a, any pattern on that. Uh, I have an example here. So this is basically the same simple patterns of dots and lines, but apply into lower Manhattan. Um, and all this is running directly in real, rendering in real time. Um, or with a little more of effort, you can go in the other direction, something more realistic. So here I'm using uh, pseudo-random uh, to generate some, um, to light some squares in some parts and not another, to generate the, the illusion that these are uh, windows. New York doesn't look like that, really. It's more like a Gotham. Um, so um, I have the privilege of uh, starting this project called Tangram Play. Uh, I, I really like making tools for the things that I do because, it's, you know, um, we are coders and um, we're um, lazy. <laughs> and sometimes you, it takes you too while. It takes, when something takes you too much to do something, you like thinking, how can I make this go faster? So I, I was editing using Sublime, and and I uh, I wanted to start like making uh, online tool to edit this uh, the scene files that we use for Tangram. Um, so I hack something together, and then Lou Hang that he um, I he joined the team of Mapsen. He's a UI engineer, and so he took uh, Tangram Play to the next level. Um, I always refer to it like we have this baby called Tangram Play. Um, so here, so here we have Tangram Play, which I encourage everybody to take a look. You have a lot of um, examples that you can look, but I don't want to overwhelm you with a lot of things. So um, I want to explain a little bit what is happening here. So probably most of you have worked uh, with um, maps before. And this is very similar to a Carto CSS or Time Mealy. It's basically something that, that decides how you take the data, how process it, and what, how to display it. Um, so here, here we defined our source. Our source is uh, maps and vector tiles. Uh, then those, those vectors comes that have different layers inside them. Uh, 
and I'm deciding which colors goes where. So for example, we can change the water to blue. That's very so original today. Um, and in this case, for example, in the building, ah, which is out of screen because if everything was zoomed, in the buildings, I'm defining a custom, um, a custom style called buildings. Uh, and here is where the magic starts, and when I, uh, it makes my job so satisfying, is that Tangram let you, gives you all, uh, some, some space to access the pipeline, um, the, uh, the WebGL pipeline, and specifically to, you can inject uh, shader code into the pipeline. Um, so here you can see how the buildings um, style set a new, um, a new line inside the shader, which basically adds this nice gr gradient between the bottom of the building to the top. So if I comment this out, you will see that the, the sad buildings. Um, let's make happy buildings. I'm, a, I'm feeling a little bit Bob Ross today. So, <laughs> so I will, how we do this? Um, I will mix two colors. Uh, I'm going to go for red to blue. Again, in a crazy act of uh, creativity. And now you, we see that the gradient goes from blue to um, red, right? Uh, and we can add some animation to that. So let's say, let's turn the anima animate um, thing on. And then use time to move this up. So I will add time. And because time goes indifferently, I'm going to um, make a thin wave. No, let's make it fract. I had to close the parentheses. So now we have a happy, flashy buildings. <laughs> <laughs> I, leave, I leave the rest for the data visualization people. <laughs> um, hope you're, you're getting excited as I am. Um, so, um, so now, now comes the data um, uh, equation on the maps. Well, maps have data, no? but what to put in a map. So this is something that I have been working on, some, some work that I have been doing. Um, but first, I, I want to speak about um, efficiency. So when you have an engine, and it's a WebGL engine, and you go on to draw stuff from the engine part of you, you want, the thing that you want to avoid is to hit the, the server too much, the, um, the driver too much, right? So imagine that we have the CPU, we, we describe that, and I, and I present this idea of the GPU like in a bottle. You don't want things to be sending constantly, right? It's like making chips in a bottle. You want to like put all your stuff in the bottle and then like just move things around in it because otherwise it will not go into um, go work. So, and I also I make reference how um, the graphic card is really uh, have some resources inside it, so it it has the ability to store the geometry, which is is going to be the map, the the same tiles that I already showed you, and images. This is very used in graph and videos, right? You put up everything. The walls has a texture and all that. So for this project that I I was working at the end of last year called. Um, line of sight, I want to visualize in real time uh, the, um, uh, all the satellites that were present. This is only a subset, right, uh, that I made. And yes, it's, it's a lot because, this, I want to get in trouble if I do this. This takes longer to load. Or, yes. So now we have all the satellites available. And imagine, imagine this. While I do this, <laughs> um, each one of them, you, you have to predict where it's going to be, right? It's, it's, this is a prediction of where it's going to be that satellite in the next hour. So um, this is around uh, 15,000 um, 
satellites that have to be visualized uh, with precision. Um, so that's a lot of points and a lot of things to be doing to be passing information from one point to another one. So I was thinking a lot about how to um, solve this problem. And, and I, came back, I, I, I came with a technique that actually is very well known in the game industry, which is, um, which is encode the data when you pass it. So this is, so, so you need 24 frames per second, right, right to make something smooth. I have um, 15, uh, uh, hundred of uh, satellites. Uh, that's a, a, around 36 um, uh, calls per second if we want to uh, animate all these satellites, which again is a lot, and this has to run in a browser, so uh, it's kind of like asking too much for a browser. So the solution was to put the information, to use the, the memory that the graphic card has, designed to hold images, to store all that data. So if I packed all the data, and, and imagine, imagine that this image is like a uh, piano roll, right? If we put all the information of all the satellites in an image, and we pass it, it's inside the bottle, and, it's, and all the information is right there. So this is how the image looks. And uh, it's very interesting, because, so each satellite will, will look in one specific row, and then it will know that the latitude is at the beginning, and then the, um, the longitude is at the beginning of the line, if, and from the second half of the, the x uh, axis, it's going to find the latitude. So basically, each satellite knows which line to read, and then it's reading from a moment and like moving the header away. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, good. Um, and that I was very happy also to discover that that saves a lot of memory. So here, the same JSON file that holds the same, the, the same information is around 20 megabytes, while the image of that is only two megabytes. So yeah, 10% <laughs> efficiency. Uh, how the satellites knows where line to, to, to see? Well, I'm using color again to encode that information. And I want to put some little bits of uh, info. Uh, so this is some JavaScript that you can also put in the YAML file for, the, for Tangram. And here I'm using the red channel and the, and the green channel to encode, to, to, trans to encode the ID of that satellite. And I'm lifting the blue channel to see if that satellite is hovered or not. It's like it's selected or not. Then in the shader part, I have these like nice functions that, according to the color of the satellite, of the satellite, it will search for a specific place. So it's like it's a, it's a way to trick the graphic card to pass information through. Um, and what what I like about this is like it's kind of uh, it's kind of the same way. It's, it's poetic in this way that um, it's how we know about the composition of the stars. Like uh, astrophysics uh, had been done this before, which is like analyzing the color of some, uh, the light coming from something, and uh, analyzing the color and getting all this extra information about this distant thing. So um, it's a nice analogy between uh, a way of like reconciling these two universes of the CPU and the GPU. So I have uh, one more. Um, example, um, which is, uh, I, I, I kind of put it together for this talk. So I, I every, every, who here has a weather map done? Because uh, Fernanda and Martin has a really famous one, and I know that, um, yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so I, I, I said, okay, I, I, this is an open biz conference. I had to do better. I had to uh, make something that they will enjoy. So don't judge me. This is my, my first uh, data visualization with this weather data. Um, so I set up a, my Raspberry Pi in my desktop to be hitting the NOAA servers every day and collecting the last 24 hours of data in wind and temperature data uh, with a Python script. Um, so that's around 70 uh, 
100 stations. You have been doing this the, the last uh, 40 days. That's uh, around uh, 960 hours. That's almost half a, uh, one and a million uh, samples, right? Um, and I'm going to, I'm storing the temperature of each station in the red channel. And in the green, the wind speed. And in the blue channel, the wind direction. Um, and in the, in the server, this image is building up. So I actually, let's get out of the presentation mode. Um, I will pass all the information about this. Uh, but if you come here, you can see the image. Actually, you have, can have access to the image itself. And, and the Raspberry it makes the pull request. So this is, has been working uh, on weekends. I think, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so this, information, this image is building up. Uh, and now and I made a small map. That, that what it does is visualize it. I know what you're thinking. I'm using a rainbow uh, gradient. I'm looking everybody in the eyes. Don't judge me. <laughs> so, um, so what, what is happening here is we have all these weather stations. Um, all that information is passed directly to the graphic card. The graphic card have all the information for all these weather stations. So uh, the animation can, be, can be go very smoothly. And I, I only need, if I want some, to add some interaction to this, I only need to pass the offset value of, from the moment. So you can like, let me, I think from the, from the distance, you can see better patterns. I add some, some feature, if somebody's curious, um, if you click one of the stations, it will give you the data and how the data looks in the image. So here you can see the, deer sp the spin di the direction, the wind direction, the speed of the wind, and the temperature changing over time and being inter interpolated in, in real time. Um, so this is, uh, I, I think this is a compelling argument of, uh, of how something, how uh, combine all techniques from other fields uh, could be very beneficial. And also, it's, it's very, I found very interesting that this image by himself. Um, I have the chance to travel uh, the last weeks and we were in Virginia with my wife, uh, I think in this uh, here, no, in this red spot here, which means there was more red, there was, it was kind of nicer days, we were more warm days. You can see here the bluish days, bluish greenish days, and how the last days has been better and better. Um, also, it's very interesting to see that there are some places that never gets cold. Uh, I guess that's Alaska? Um, it's always uh, cold there. Yeah. Um, So here's the link to this. Feel free to play with it. Um, this is a link to this presentation. Um, any question uh, that you want to answer, I will be glad to reply it. Uh, I will going to be around. I want to thank so much to everybody for going through this. Thank you for dealing with my accent. And uh, thank you, Boku, for inviting me. Bye-bye.